I'll just admit it all. So we should have about 26 people joining us. Well, good. And as everyone joins, uh, I'll be sure to mute everybody besides the presenters. How many folks do we have now? Uh, including 35 engineers and everybody, yeah. I'd give it about five minutes to let some other people join. Just had another one join. Okay. Doug, it looks like the waiting room is empty. Okay, well, we can go ahead and kind of get started and, uh, and then welcome anybody else that joins us uh, late and cover whatever we need to. Um, we'll start this meeting. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Doug Helt. I'm the lead engineer uh, for transportation design with the city of Tulsa. Um, we have several uh, staff members on the line and then I'm just not going to name everybody but I am going to name a few people that are uh, the names that you should all have uh, written down at some point during this meeting. There's myself. Um, Nancy Doty is on the line. She is the senior engineer with the city of Tulsa and she, in our group and she's the project manager for this job. Uh, we have Brent Stout on the line. He is a planning lead engineer, and he is, um, <clears throat> he's, he's the MMLOS uh, leader for this part of the project. Uh, also on the call, we have Poe & Associates, who is a consulting engineering firm, and uh, Lee Engineering, who is also a consulting firm. So I'll introduce those folks again here in a minute. Um, the picture that you have on your screen right now is uh, what we call the Gilcrease Area Paving Improvements. This shows a number of the projects that we have currently planned in the area. The project that we're here to talk about specifically today is this, the 25th West Avenue widening, which is the orange piece uh, on the screen there. We have several other 
it, it's orange on my screen. I don't know if it's orange to everybody's screen, but it's, it's orange on mine. <laughs> um, there's several other components that are part of the larger project package that we're putting together. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, all of these projects are funded through the Improve Our Tulsa program. Uh, all of the projects that are, were, that are involved here have a total uh, funding budget of around 16 million. And so we're putting together a lot of these projects so that we can have the construction be complete before the, uh, the museum is finished. So that way we can uh, be out of the way when that happens. So our, we have a target completion date for all of this work of October, 2024. Uh, so the purpose of this meeting is specifically to talk about 25th West Avenue and what we call the multimodal level of service analysis. This is where, and this meeting is specifically to get input from the public on what we have, uh, what we've, what we have planned out there, as well as what we are just soliciting information too. So there's a lot of things to talk about. During the, um, during the presentation, if you have questions, you can post those in the chat and Nancy and myself will, and uh, Rusty will be digging the, through those to try and find answers as we go through the thing. Um, we'll answer questions and we get to the end of the, of the presentation. Um, there's probably some things to talk about surrounding these projects that are not related to the multimodal level of service analysis that all of us geek engineers are here to talk about. And uh, we'll be happy to take those questions, but if we don't have answers for those, we're gonna just ask you to be patient with, with us while it, we'll get you connected to the right people. So, <clears throat> um, Was there any other housekeeping items that I needed to talk about, Brent? I don't think so. I think you've covered it. Okay. So um, I would like, to, we have a presentation here, and uh, Brent Stout with City of Tulsa is going to make that presentation. They have some slides. Um, and then uh, Ryan Henderson with Lee Engineering is going to come in and finish it and give you some excruciating detail on uh, engineering uh, topics related to this street. When we get to the end, uh, we'll, we'll have kind of a round robin discussion. Um, we'll have to figure out how, uh, we'll probably do the chat questions at when we get to the end in the order that they're posted. So um, Brent, I pass this to you and thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Doug. I'd like to welcome everybody again to our meeting to discuss the Go Crease Museum Road multimodal level of service study from Charles Page to Apache. And this is our public in involvement meeting that we have on all of our multimodal studies. The purpose of this meeting is to explain the city's process for developing alternative multimodal roadway sections on Gilcrease Museum Road and to receive public input. What is a multimodal study? Well, it addresses the vehicle pedestrian, cyclist, and transit needs of a corridor rather than just focus, focusing on the vehicle needs for the corridor design. In the past, there may have been some perception and some reality in that we've looked at vehicles uh, exclusively and haven't really looked at the other modes of travel, so we've attempted to do that with this multimodal study. The reasons why we're doing this, uh, this started with Planet Tulsa uh, that was the planning project to update the city's comprehensive plan. It involved public input from a lot of different groups, or maybe some people in, that were involved in that on this call, and uh, individual citywide. That plan was approved in July of 2010, and the plan included goals for achieving multimodal streets in Tulsa. There are four goals here that are the multimodal goals, and particularly I'd like to draw your attention to goal 7.1, which is providing comfortable and attractive pedestrian and bicycle facilities within existing and new developments, and goal 14.1, which is improving the integration of on-street bicycle facilities with Tulsa Parks, 
and off street trail systems through the use of road diets, traffic calming, signage, bike lanes, and shared lane markings. Now we have the Tulsa Metropolitan Area Major Street and Highway Plan. This is uh, what a map that INCOG has developed uh, for the region, and they update this map periodically. And what it shows are the streets by classification, which is uh, parkways, primary arterials, secondary arterials, residential collectors, et cetera. All those streets are shown by classification on the map. It also shows the designation of the streets, which are main street, multimodal, or commuter streets. There's approximately 160 miles of planned multimodal streets in Tulsa. We've done most of these uh, studies for these sections uh, to date, and this is one of our last ones that we're doing here tonight. Gilcrease Museum Road is the secondary arterial street in the Major Street and Highway Plan. So these two typical sections are uh, used from the Major Street and Highway Plan as the basis for our design. And there you see that there are uh, four lanes with bike lanes and then also a five lane with bike lanes. These are just the standard sections that we use as the basis for our studies. The GO plan, or the Bicycle Pedestrian Master Plan, as it's known, uh, it's included in the regional plan, uh, bicycle pedestrian infrastructure for 25th West Avenue. And that included bike lanes and shared lanes. It also shows a side path from Edison to Pine. So it's bike lane from US 412 to Edison, and then a signed route from Pine to Apache, and then again, the side path from Edison to Pine. In 2011, there was a, a growing national movement for cities to adopt a complete streets policy. And a lot of cities around the country did that. And so Tulsa was encouraged to do that along with uh, or through FHWA and the US Department of Transportation. So by resolution, we adopted by city council on February 2nd, 2012, the complete streets resolution. And as part of that resolution, it required the development of a complete streets policy guide. And this guide was put together after a lot of meetings internally and, and staff discussion in 2013. And it includes details on implementing the complete streets planning process and design process and develop performance measures for each mode of travel on all the different street types. This was a process flow chart that was developed as part of the manual. And this was included in the, in the manual. It shows that we're in the conceptual design phase of the project now in the concept public meeting stage. Next slide, please. So that's where we are tonight. The next slide shows a photo representation of a different multimodal levels of service. So uh, level of service is a measure of the modal perception of the roadway user. So level of service A is indicated by wide open travel lanes, as you see here, with no congestion for autos or bikes, uh, wide open sidewalks with a buffer from traffic for pedestrians, and frequent bus service for transit. Level of service F is total gridlock, heavy congestion for autos, no separate facilities for bikes with heavy traffic, no accommodation for pedestrians, and less than or equal to one bus an hour on the street segment. The Highway Capacity Manual, the sixth edition in 2016 is the basis for our study. It's kind of the, uh, the Bible, so to speak, for traffic engineers, accepted guidance for the industry. So this has the methodology that we use to do the study. Why are we doing the study? Well, it was identified as best practice for computing multimodal performance by the TRB of the National Academies. It provides an object objective methodology to optimize transportation corridors based on modal priorities. It's based on significant research and development, provides a consistent planning process. The results can be readily measured against defined performance measures that we have in the Complete Streets for, uh, Procedural Manual. 
and it is intended to diminish public perceptions of preconceived or biased planning processes. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Ryan Henderson with Lee Engineering to go over the results of the study. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted a quick reminder um, to use the chat box function if you have any questions so you can ask them when you get them so you don't have to remember them until the end. And then when you ask the question, if you could include your contact information with them. Okay, so shown here is the extent of the, the study, um, beginning with Charles Page, and extends two and a half miles north to Apache Street. The corridor includes four signalized intersections and four unsignalized intersections. And now I've got a few slides here that just kind of show some existing conditions along the corridor. Uh, picture one shows the signal at Charles Page at the uh, southern end of the study. And then picture two shows the uh, four lane section as you move north of Charles Page. Uh, picture three shows the Katy Tro crossing as just south of 412. And then that also ties into picture four, which is the New Walk Park Trail. That's just south of 412 as well. That kind of connects into Katy Trail and heads south along the east side of Gilcrease Museum Road. Uh, pictures four and five are the signalized intersections at US 412. Uh, picture seven and uh, picture seven uh, shows the, kind of the horizontal curves as you approach Edison Street. Uh, two curves back to back there. There's some tight right-of-way constraints. So you can see the, the building that's pretty close to the edge of the roadway there and some utilities in this area. So it's kind of a, a tricky spot along this corridor to design around. And then uh, picture eight, we've got Edison Street, uh, the signal there. We've got some new bike lanes to tie this project into. Uh, picture nine uh, is the intersection of Haskell Street and 10 is the four-way stop at Newton Street. Uh, picture 11, this is where we have the, the stone wall at Gilchrist Museum, it's just north of Newton Street. Picture 12, we're showing the intersection of Pine Street. It's a three-way stop. And 13, and there's a two-way stop at the end of the study at Apache Street. And now we'll move on to the uh, study portion of the multimodal study. And here's some of the, the steps we took to get to where we are today. Uh, we did a big data collection effort and a survey. We moved into a collision study, speed study, a lighting study, access study, a then we went into traffic modeling and uh, we developed some preliminary alternatives and took those to the city and had a work session to kind of go over those and figure out which ones we wanted to move forward with into analysis. And uh, then we moved into the multimodal analysis of those alternatives. And then we developed a draft report. And now that brings us to where we are today to, to present to you all and gather input. Uh, then the first part of the study was the collision study. So we found 62 uh, collisions over the most recent five years of available data, which was from January 1st, 2016 through December 31st of 2020. Uh, there were 15 of those collisions that resulted in injuries. 19 had possible injuries but there were no severe injuries reported or fatalities. And now here's a, a breakdown of where all those collisions occurred along the corridor. As you can see, most of them took place around the uh, commercial area just north of 412, which is that just heavily travel area with McDonald's, Brahms, uh, the gas station and hotel. 
And about 80% of those collisions were turning right angle and rear end collisions, which kind of indicates that most of them were intersection related. And of those 62 collisions, uh, about 63% of those were caused by a failure to yield or stop at those intersections. And most of the collisions uh, occurred during lit conditions. So poor lighting is not one of the main concerns of the cause of collisions. The uh, study corridor has mostly acceptable light levels um, south of Edison Street. Um, it's just recommended that we upgrade the fixtures to LED and replace the non-functioning fixtures. However, north of Edison, the light levels are poor and below minimum levels. And that effort to upgrade that section is estimated to around $216,000 to install new, new light fixtures and poles. And for just to upgrade the LED south of Edison Street, it's estimated around $20,000. Then for the speed study, we looked at a few intermediate locations along the corridor um, that we analyzed for speed. Uh, south of Edison, the posted speed limit is 35 miles per hour and the observed 85th percentile speed was just a little more, uh, it's about two miles per hour more, uh, which is pretty typical in most locations. Um, but near Haskell Place and north of Pine Street, the observed speed was about five to nine miles per hour over the posted speed limit. Um, so it's a little concerning, it's a little high. However, there's some steep grades in the area, it's open section, there's little traffic flow. So, but with this proposed roadway design changes, um, we anticipate that these speeds will decrease. And now access management, who benefits from access management? Um, it's really everyone. Um, it creates fewer decision points, uh, fewer conflict points. Um, you, you have fewer crosswalks for cyclists and pedestrians to cross. And then you also reduce delay and travel times for, for transit and vehicles. And then access man management can be accomplished by eliminating or consolidating redundant uh, and unused driveways. Uh, we can relocate driveways to more appropriate locations. Uh, we can also modify the access points that might be at a, a skew angle so we can try to get them toward a more perpendicular and a safer design. Uh, we can also narrow some of the excess excessively um, wide driveways, which reduces the, uh, the crosswalk lengths for pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, and in this study, we had about five access points that we determined that we can modify uh, or eliminate. Uh, four of those were kind of unused driveways that I think we can eliminate, and one was in an improper location too close to an intersection that will look to move further away. And that would be a reduction of about 10%. Uh, traffic counts were taken last year at several locations along the corridor. Uh, most of the traffic utilizing this section um, was south of Edison Street. That's where most of the traffic occurs near US 412. Uh, we then applied a growth factor to forecast uh, future traffic conditions for the year 2041. Uh, this data was used in the analysis uh, of the intersections and segments of the corridor. Uh, next, we did a signal warrant analysis at two of the unsignalized intersections uh, of Pine Street and Apache Street. And based on the projected traffic volumes, none of these signal warrants were met at either location. So it is not recommended to install any new traffic signals. Uh, 
And then the next step was to determine what alternatives to an out analyze. Uh, and we looked at, uh, ended up looking at four different options and which included a no change option. So we can use for uh, the com comparison purposes maybe. Uh, the no change, and that is a, what's out there existing. It's a four lane undivided section. Uh, there are currently very little sidewalk present. Uh, most of that is just in that area south of Easton Street and north of 412. Um, there are no bicycle lanes, no routes or shared paths specifically along Gilchrist Museum right now. And then the, there's three bus stops located along the corridor south of Edison Street. Only one has a shelter and the frequency is about one bus per hour. Alternative one what is a boulevard style design. It consists of a two lane section with a curb median and which will provide exclusive left turn lanes at certain intersections within the segment. And then there is a 10 foot shared use path for cyclists and pedestrians and a landscape buffer between the path and the roadway. And this is projected to be on the uh, east side of the roadway. Uh, alternative one is only considered for the segment between uh, Edison Street and Apache Street, and which will add a nice gateway uh, near the museum. Alternative two uh, it consisted of a three lane section, the two through lanes, a center two way left turn lane, on street bike lanes on each side with buffers, and a sidewalk on both sides of the roadway. Alternative number three uh, it consisted of a four lane section, had two, two through lanes on the interior, and then two through lanes on the exterior that included shadow markings for cyclists. And then this also included that sidewalk on each side. And here's a breakdown, of, like a decision matrix that kind of summarizes all the analysis for each alternative. Um, and the main, main key points I'll, I'll look at here, kind of showcase is the pedestrian and cyclist improvements for the LOS, um, mainly from alternative one and two. They improved from fair to very good on both of those. And then while we are um, decreasing the amount of lanes in some areas and uh, doing a road diet, there the average delay for vehicles very slightly increased. So it's kind of good to see there that there's not much change for, for vehicles, even though we're losing a lane. The preferred alternatives that we selected were was alternative one is the preferred alternative for segment between Edison Street and Apache Street. And then alternative two is the preferred alternative for the segment between US 412 and Edison Street. Let's submit them before March 7th uh, so we can incorporate those. And then, if, if you need to mail comments, uh, you can come to the City of Tulsa with the attention of Brent. Uh, I always learned something that uh, I thought that was was pretty good. I see. I put the uh, the complete streets procedural manual in the chat box so that we. Uh, that's it. That was an easy one to get to everybody. Um, 
there's a question in the uh, chat box about uh, receiving the recording after this is over. And yes, we can make that happen. I think we have a place to post it, but I, I may not know exactly where that is at this very moment. I think that we have a place where we can post this on our City of Tulsa website. Just to add to that, Doug, this is Rusty Ackerman and Poe. Right. Uh, in, order, in order for us to get the, the video link and stuff out, we will need some contact in the chat. So, yes, the, the request is that everybody that's online uh, or in the call, if you could put your name and your uh, your your phone number and your uh, email address in there, then we can have a contact information, have that. Um, we have, uh, so I'm just going to pick on a random person here because I don't know how to work this thing. Sarah, I think we need to have your email or we may have it all, all already up there, but like, uh, Aaron, do we have your email? There we go. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> hey, hey, Doug, and also, they can uh, scroll to the top of the chat and get Nancy's email and email her directly, and they, they'll be added to that contact list, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Yes. I posted my email in there as well. Um, so, uh, Ryan, the... Uh, Alternate number one is what the uh, study ends up recommending. Is that correct? It is a mix. So it's alternate one from Edison Street north to Apache. Okay. And then alternate two from Edison Street south to US 412. So the option one, Ryan, was the one with the middle, uh, with like the trees and the, it was two lanes, one lane each direction with kind of like the median kind of situation from uh, Edison North. Can Correct. I scroll back, Ryan, to that? I sure can. And then south of that was the uh, more traffic flow with the four lanes. Right. Yeah, south of that is the... It's like the three lanes got the two-way left turn lane in the middle. <clears throat> so uh, let's see, let me get up here and find the top of these questions and make sure that we're answering these. Uh, so the I read that one, we'll see. <clears throat> Judy Gar asks, says that I'm interested in hearing the plan for the pond next to 25th near Apache. And um, I can tell you that I'm interested in knowing how that's going to be affected as well uh, but we we need to decide we're, we're deciding on this roadway section before we get to that uh, actual uh, design element uh, so it's a little premature to talk about what what's really going to happen there because we're still working on the layout of the roadway section because this study needed to happen first so that's a pretty non-answer, Judy, but that's where I am today. <laughs> uh, and Doug, I think that ex answers uh, Dr. Thompson's question asking about when they will know about uh, any property being affected. Yeah, no, this is, uh, this is really... Uh, we're, we're concerned about that too, so we always try to minimize these things as best we can, um, but that it is still a little bit premature to know exactly which, which pieces will be there um, yet. Yeah. 
So, um, Ryan, uh, Mark, and Angela Swift are asking about the intersections. About in the in the sections that don't have an intersection, would the roadway go to two lane, like from Independence to Newton? Do you see that question from the Swifts? Yes. So. Yeah, so we'd go to two lanes and then you'd have a median in the middle. <clears throat> is so that shared use? Sorry, on this picture right here, is that shared use path on the east side or the west side of is that plan for the east side of the street or the west side of the, the road? It's planned for the east side of the road right now. Okay, thanks. That is correct. So I'm skipping over uh, P. Mandrill's question about $16 million because that $16 million is what has been allocated to the street uh, projects. I don't know the full number because I don't have the water numbers in front of me. So I can, I can get a little bit closer on actual numbers, but there is uh, $16 million for all of these projects that are surrounding it. The actual widening uh, of the road is, is where the majority of that is uh, budgeted, though. <clears throat> Larry Mitchell, I did we say that we were going to put Sharrows on a 45 mile hour road, Ryan Henderson? No, no you didn't yeah. say that, but that was an option, option three. So thank you for not choosing that option. Definitely appreciate that. And I don't believe any of this section will be 45 mile an hour. I think we're going to. Right, yeah. Brian, south, Brian, south of Edison is 35, and north of Edison is 40 right now. Okay. There's no plans to increase speed limits. Great. It's getting better and better. Thank you. Um, Brian Rogers, we, we, we are going to impact some uh, structures, but I don't know what to what degree yet and I so if if you think your house is one of those please reach out to us and we'll talk about it I I don't I don't I don't really know where we are on on all of that at the moment because we've still got to determine this layout here so Tanya Johnson asks about the allocation to be spent on lighting improvements um so, Ryan, I, I don't, do you want to go back to your slide on lighting? I don't know I that we have a specific budget item for this. No, I just listed kind of an estimate on what we kind of thought on what it would take to install new lighting in some areas and replace some. So this uh, information, we. Uh, we can use to, um, to to determine if we can actually afford that within our budget. I do not know at this moment where that falls. I do know that the corridor itself, um, that some lighting has been talked about, um, but I, I don't know the full extents of that yet. So this, this is, um, I'm full of non-answers, aren't I? Tanya, this is a this is a planning document that says here's what we think it would take to get there. So now we take this information and we plug that into the rest of our uh, project components and we see how that fits. I would take from your comment and it now says 16 new messages below you uh, that improving this this improving lighting would be something that the public would really like. So I think we take note of that from your, your question. You want to talk about lighting, Ryan, or, um, or, or Brent? 
we want to see if we have the money to do this in our budget, as you said. So that's just something we have to determine as we go forward with the project design. Okay. So um, Kim asks, uh, if, if the road goes to two lanes, will there be reconsideration for adding stoplights? Did Ryan, where did, did we have a road diet in there? But I, I don't think that we were planning on reducing that section, that commercial section to two lanes, were we? That was not in the recommendation, rather. Yeah, there's a, it's in the recommendation to, to go down to that three lane section with the two way left turn lane. Um, and we, we analyzed that for, we're not gonna, we're not planning on adding any stoplights at this point. So um, um, can, can you go to that section in your slides where we have the recommendation for that commercial section? Rosemary Powell asks about closures on the GM on on Gilcrease Museum Road from Edison to Pat, Apache and how will traffic be diverted? And the, the intent would be during all construction that we would maintain our, our traffic through the corridor and not and traffic would not be diverted to onto any, um, any road unnecessarily. However, there's probably gonna be an occasion where that might happen on a temporary basis, but that would not be a planned action. So as we get a little closer towards an actual construction uh, set of plans, then we'll be able to answer those types of questions uh, pretty a, a lot better. Hey, Doug, a question from uh, Rusty, just because I think it will probably help some people. Later on in the design, will there be another public meeting? Yes, we can have another public meeting as we get uh, to our preliminary plans and we can present where we're at uh, on on what uh, you know what we've put together based on this study and this meeting and the input that we're gathering tonight. Yes, we would have it. We will have another public meeting. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see, Aaron Temple. I think yours is very specific. Maybe we need to talk about that one offline or just about yours. The city currently owns a property. Wait a minute. <clears throat> so a lot of these design elements have not been decided. So what I'd like to consider is the questions that are being put into the chat. I would like to consider those uh, as you know, comments from you and so that we will know that these are things that we need to talk about. And then, for example, uh, Aaron Temple, we can reach out to you specifically and talk about uh, if, if that's, I don't think that's your specific property that you're asking about. Um, so that's a kind of how we should get there. I'm I probably should have a better method for answering these questions with a little bit of hindsight at this point. Um, hey, hey, Doug. Yeah. There seems like there's a lot of questions on on the Newton and and uh, Gilchrist Museum Road as far as which you know the, the, everybody's aware that the the city owns a corner of that property. And obviously we're gonna look at widening to that, that area as much as we can. For one, it saves headache for the residents, it saves money for the city and, and just has the least impact on the residents. And as a design engineer, you know, we're gonna do our, our best given all those circumstances to, to put forth the best design on that. Thank you, Rusty. I feel like you've, you've pulled me out of the ditch there a little bit. Um, there's some other questions down here about um, the, uh, how much land we're gonna get. We, there is some right of way that we may need to require, but we have not identified what all of those are. There's some utilities that are through there that we have to work around. Um, 
pedestrian crossing at Haskell and Fairview. Ryan, did we address that? Is that um, is that close to the entrance of the? No, well, Haskell's stop control. So that's once we put a sidewalk in, there'll be a, a crossing there and ramps. So um, I think maybe the question might be, would there be a, a light for a pedestrian crossing? And the answer would be no, not. Yeah, there's no plans for any new, new signals. Right. Charles Bruce, thank goodness you asked that question. Is there an estimated start date? Uh, no, it is soon though. We have uh, this real timeline that I, I pointed out at the beginning, which is to finish by the end of October of 24. I mean, there's uh, some real time involved with the construction. So we will have to have some of this uh, work on the, the very first slide that we showed with the uh, other side streets or the streets not associated with Gilcrease Museum Road. We will have to start those projects towards the end of this uh, summer and construction cycle to get in the, get those in and start meeting our deadlines. So um, hopefully we'll start seeing some activity, not necessarily on Gilcrease Museum Road itself, but on some of the outside streets to here in the, uh, by the starting towards the end of this summer. Um, I, I think that, uh, <clears throat> But I'll, again, we're going to have another public meeting and we'll be able to answer that when we get to that next step. So uh, let's see. How will this expansion affect the environment in regards to the animals? I don't know. <laughs> um, we don't actually have, uh, I don't know that we're, we have any uh, specific environmental impact mitigation on this particular project. So uh, I'm not expecting anything uh, to be unusual on anything that we're doing here. Uh, we really stay in within the corridor. So um, can't answer the easement questions yet. And Bobby will be paying attention to everybody. Everybody's going to have access through these these projects um, when we're doing the construction. We'll maintain the two-way traffic uh, through these uh, as we're building them. <clears throat> Tanya, usually the lighting comes in at the at the at the end uh, of the project, so that I, I would expect lighting and. Uh, to go up with the with the paint and the banners. And I'm just kind of joking there, so. No, we have not. This, uh, Ryan, this, we did not do any noise study as part of this analysis, did we? No, it wasn't a part of this. Okay. Um, the, you know, we're not installing a, a, a turnpike so, uh, through this particular section. So um, the, my, my thought of uh, any noise mitigation hopefully would be very, very small and actually be pretty minimal, the, any impact would be pretty minimal with this particular project. Um, we're not planning on building a five lane road through there. That would have an impact. Uh, but the, the alternative that I think is presented is, is not necessarily that. So um. <clears throat> so uh, I would like to probably uh, start getting close to wrapping this up. I want to make sure that everybody has somebody to contact after this meeting, even if it is to just tell us uh, what an amazing job we did. Um, 
So please remember that my information is at the top of this. Uh, Nancy Doty is, uh, and I will address uh, everything. Okay, thank you, Rusty. <clears throat> Ryan, can you scroll to the last slide, please? Oh yeah, there's Brent's information. Um, I think that uh, we would like to have uh, your your input. We'll take your your emails and your phone calls, and and we'll talk about this. And we we want everybody to make sure that you feel like you're heard because we want to hear you. So, um, Brent and team, is there anything else that we need to talk about here? The messages seem to have stopped. No, just like to thank everybody for their time this evening and just uh, send us their comments if they have additional additional ones. All right, thank you very much. We're thank looking you. forward to your uh, to your input. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.